knowing your role on the team. I, I think where the challenge is, is that balance between uh, learn how to follow well, but also having an environment that's collaborative and you're seeking input and you want to um, value the perspectives of the team, but finding a way to balance that with, look, the leader's got a hard job to do and they need to make decisions and a good leader is going to seek your input, but your job is to do your job. Hey there, and welcome to the Tribe of Leaders podcast. I'm your host, Emmy Kirshner. I'm a serial entrepreneur, investor, and business coach for ambitious women who are boldly taking their business to the next level. And I believe that building a successful business isn't about working 24-7 just to merely meet a revenue goal. What it does take is a unique blend of dedication to purpose, courageous action, and frequently sheer will to overcome the odds that lead to meaningful impact and experiencing a life well lived. In each episode, you'll get to know the women and men who are unafraid to put it all on the line as they share the stories of success and failure that have made them incredible leaders and the magic they gift the world with. As you're listening, and I hope finding value, don't forget to share the Tribe of Leaders podcast with all of your other entrepreneurial friends and to follow us wherever you're listening to this podcast. Hey, Tribe. When I had Allie Groveview pitch to me as a potential guest for the podcast, she is a senior consultant at Ignite Management. And as I do with all of my guests, um, I like to check out their website and you know do a little bit of background research so I know who I'm talking to um, and obviously make sure it's a great fit for you. But what I loved about this and what really made me want to be able to get to know Ali is that um, she is described as if the only person that you could be stranded with on a desert island, everybody picks Ali because she's the go-to person for insight and honest assessment and inspiration. And True to that description, um, my conversation with Ali was very inspirational, and I really appreciate and value her straightforward opinion, insight, and knowledge in leadership and what it takes to be a good leader, be a good CEO, and a fantastic business owner. So a couple of things that we talked about, um, and she uses her experience as an officer in the Royal Canadian Navy, which she joined um, the military, I'm going to say later in life, but older than the average 17 or 18 year old who usually joins. But she describes her learning there as part of the influence for her belief systems and how she um, helps leaders excel currently. And we talked about how um, being a good leader is learning to be a good follower and why that's important. Um, we talk about why doing one thing at a time. And I have to say, this is the one thing that my creative entrepreneurial brain still, I'm going to say struggles with because I have to be really um, focused and, you know, say no to a lot of different things or write something down real quick so that I can stay focused. So if you are an idea generator like I am, this is going to be helpful for you. And then how to become disciplined, which I think is another area, particularly for those of us who are creative and feels like structure or doing the thing, even when you don't want to, is not fun. She has some really great tips in how to help you be more disciplined so that you can get the things that you want and the things that matter done so that you can excel. So tune into this. I think you're really going to like it. Hey, Allie, I am just so looking forward to our conversation today. And I'm going to be very transparent. So I was checking out your website before our call and it starts off with in your your kind of about you section um, of ignite management that if somebody could only pick one person to be with on a desert island you're the person to go with so one welcome to the show and two I would love to know how you got designated as <laughs> like the person that everybody wants to hang with yeah I uh, thank you I'm 
excited to be here as well. I that was one of the biggest compliments to me. I did not write that myself, just to be clear. Yeah. But it was written partially by the team and it was it's such a compliment. Um and I think it's I believe it's less about somebody they want to hang out with, more about resourcefulness or like problem solving. I think that's kind of what what that came from. Um but yeah, great compliment. It's always fun to see how other people see you. Yeah. Absolutely. And Mm -hmm. for me, it says a lot. It's one, people want to be with you. Two, you solve problems. Three, you're a safety net. Four, like they just, you build community. So that's, that's a pretty amazing accolade. And, and it says a lot also about how as the chief operating officer that you're leading the business. Yeah, so I'm um, I'm not the COO. I have been the COO. I'm not of, of this firm, um, but I am part of the management team. And I definitely, like trust is a big, trust is one of our tenants and building trust-based relationships and how do you do that? And it's something that we coach um, our clients around as well. And when I get feedback from the team and I do get this feedback, I get good and bad feedback. We're pretty open here, but feedback that they trust me, that they feel like I'm a safe place to come to, that they can bring anything to me and they're not worried about how I'm going to react uh, or that I'm always going to kind of bring the same kind of consistent calm to whatever they're bringing is huge, huge praise for me. So feels good. That's awesome. Let's talk about your background a little bit too and, and how you arrived where you're at right now with leadership development and, um, and really building this team, et cetera. Mm -hmm. Okay. So I'll give you some broad strokes and then feel free to probe in if um, there's a specific area you're interested in. So I started in like the startup small business space. Um, I was working in clean tech uh, for a startup technology company, and that was quite a formative period for me. I was with them for five years early in my career and I, I had a variety of roles and coming out of that experience, I that's when I first started thinking about, I really want to work at that time with small businesses, startups on strategy, primarily strategy, but they're, they're super intertwined. Right. So strategy and leadership, because I saw having been exposed to so many emerging organizations, I saw a major gap uh, in, in what I would like to see in these organizations, which is really around strategic discipline. Um, And that seemed really lacking in in these early emerging stage companies. So I I started getting into um, really wanting to work with organizations to bring in some strategy and and good business practices, which is kind of where I started moving into uh, consulting independently years before I joined uh, this firm. And then the leadership development piece was a bit more of a personal passion in parallel with that. I'm really, really interested in personal development, really about the belief that if we lift ourselves, we lift others. And so there's a really natural tie into leadership. Mm -hmm. So I was kind of playing in both of those areas um, as an independent consultant, again, working mostly with smaller organizations. Over that time, I joined the Navy in Canada. So I was doing naval contracts, getting some new perspective on leadership from that experience. And then uh, through that period, really wanted to, to transition into working with somewhat larger organizations. So I was still very much in the small nonprofit, small business, like less than 50, oftentimes less than 20 people. And I really wanted to get more into the mid midsize space um, and do more strategy work. Whereas smaller entrepreneurial organizations, I found that their need and what they wanted or saw value in was less around strategy and more around operational foundations. Mm -hmm. So through all that experience, kind of got to talking to the founder of um, Ignite, who I had crossed paths with, uh, and then joined this organization about three and a half years ago now, uh, when it was still pretty small. I think I was maybe number three. Uh, There was a another consultant and one associate, I think, here at the time. And uh, the team has grown in the last few years. So how many people are on the team now? We have 10 now. That's amazing. Yeah. And we've got, we have two open roles right now. So we should be, we're hoping to be probably 12, 13 at the end of the year. And then we'll go from there. Super cool. What made you decide to join the Navy? 
I have, I was really interested. I, I don't really know where it started, but I think it emerged in high school. I was really interested in uh, being a spy. Mm-hmm. I wanted to be an intelligence officer and I was super into like shows about the CIA. And I was, I had this thing in the back of my mind, but it was this kind of silly idea or so I thought at the time. Um, it wasn't really something that I was serious about pursuing. It was more of, um, I don't know, a fun dream, I guess, based somewhat on what I see in TV and movies. Like it was not totally reality based. And then as I went through university, I kept coming back to this idea and I was still really drawn to it. Um, something in um, special forces, military, something to, in doing intelligence work. And then it started to become a bit more reality based of kind of looking at what that would actually look like. And I was just really drawn to it, but I ignored it for many years. And what I found was every time over my career, when I would be thinking about what do I want to do next, or I want to change and where should I be looking, I kept coming back to this same idea. Mm -hmm. And I got to a point, I joined quite late. I was, I think, 32, 31 or 32 when I joined, which is most people join when they're much younger. Right, right. Um, By the time I did that, it was whatever it was that was calling me, it just kept getting louder and louder and louder and it wasn't going away. And I got to a point where I thought, if I don't do something about this or explore this in some way, I'm going to have regrets or questions later in life. So I looked into um, I looked into the Navy, specifically into intelligence work in the Navy and got into the process, applied, and I was just super, super into it from the moment that I started the process. It's so it's so interesting because it's like a little not I'm gonna say diversion, but it's yeah. a, something that's very different than kind of the traditional path. Now, did yeah. you um did you have to do boot camp or I don't know what the yeah, we call it, um, it's the same thing. We call it basic training. Uh, yeah. Yes, I had 10 weeks of basic training, which was done in Eastern Canada. And then I was back and forth between full-time contracts. I'd come back to Vancouver for a period. I'd be doing part-time service while I was doing consulting work. And then I'd take a full-time contract with the Navy. And primarily I was in Eastern Canada. So I would go, I did the 10-week uh, basic training, and then there was ongoing training after that. I had another, my big contract was about seven months at an army base in Ontario. And in between those contracts, uh, coming back and trying to do my strategy leadership independent consulting work, which was, I was really trying to do two things at once. I was kind of pursuing two careers at the same time um, and ultimately decided this isn't going to work. I can't do both. So I I needed to pick one. So I came, I joined Ignite. I did part-time service. So I was working full-time here and still Mm -hmm. doing uh, part-time service at the local naval unit. And it was way too much. I completely burnt myself out. Mm -hmm. And then after about nine, 10 months of doing that, um, I took a leave from the Navy and I haven't gone back. So I'm technically, I'm not in active service anymore. Technically, I'm still an officer in the Navy, but I'm in the reserve, like called up in case of emergency component of the military. Yeah. So cool. I'm curious too, like, what do you feel like you learned being in the military about or about being a leader or leadership in general that you might not have learned through other experiences? I think the most interesting, two really interesting things And I found as I was going through the training, it was almost a bit of this out of body experience where because I had done this, I had been doing leadership work and this was kind of um, my business side or civilian work. I was looking at it through that lens. So I was actively participating and doing the training and the work, but I also felt like I was kind of watching it from above. Right, right. Really an interesting experience. Um, One is how they build teams. And this sounds kind of obvious in hindsight, but it was super clear of what they were trying to do in training in terms of um, how great teams form. Uh, And it was all around like being really clear on your role, really understanding how to be a good follower. One of the premises of um, officer training is before you can learn to be a good leader, you need to learn to be a good follower. So it was about teaching people how to follow, how to know your role, build your skills, understand your role on the team versus others. And then the whole um, uh, putting teams through challenge, basically, and uh, really pushing them 
where they have to solve problems together and be put into difficult situations and come out the other end and seeing how teams really gel and form through those experiences, which is kind of unique to the military. I think you see it in sports. It's harder to replicate in business, but Mm -hmm. it's a really great lesson of if you go through challenge and persevere together, you're stronger on the other side. Yeah, absolutely. And I guess that was kind of my next question too, is how do you implement some of that in business with a lot of different Mm -hmm. dynamics? And I think, well, I've never been in the military, so maybe it's true there too, but where I think there's more crossover in in roles um, in business. Yeah, I've actually been thinking about this a lot lately. Um, Somebody asked me last week if I had any advice on being led, which was a great question because that's usually people are asking about leadership and someone was asking about what advice you have to be someone who follows well, essentially. And I went right back to the military example of know your role, know the roles of your teammates, strive to be exceptional in your role and build your skills. If the leader is asking for your opinion or input, give it. And when the leader makes a decision, implement it. It's sort of, it's somewhat black and white and it's very structured in that way. And it's very, it's very clear how you do it when you're in the military. Mm -hmm. I believe that those principles are valid for business. And I think we all, and we're all followers, right? Or most of us entrepreneurs know, but most people have bosses. I have a boss. So, and it's those, it's those practices that really are going to show and develop your value as a member of the team and help you uh, move into leadership if leadership is what you're looking to do. But it is much harder. It's much harder to implement. Knowing your role, being really good at it, knowing your role on the team. I, I think where the challenge is, is that balance between uh, learn how to follow well, but also having an environment that's collaborative and you're seeking input and you want to right. um, value the perspectives of the team, but finding a way to balance that with, look, the leader's got a hard job to do and they need to make decisions and a good leader is going to seek your input, but your job is to do your job and provide input where it's needed. Um, and it's it's hard, especially with um, where let's say corporate culture is going, which I think is largely positive. Yes. Of really involving employees and being people focused and people driven, which is absolutely our philosophical approach here at Ignite. It can swing too much in one direction where you could get really bogged down by getting into like a consensus based type mm-hmm. of environment. Um, so I think um, it's finding that balance, but there's yeah. definitely a place for it. Yeah. Cause it, I, I think we've been in a, an authoritarian model for far too long. And I think the complete contrast is exactly what you just said, where the the consensus base so basis. So all you have is a lot of talk and nobody's making a decision. Yeah. So isn't it like imagine this beautiful scenario where so that that authoritarian um command and control, do what I tell you to do, like that is not that's not good for anyone. It's not good for society. It's not good for business. And it's not good for long-term business results. Um, on the other swing of the pendulum, super consensus based, no one making a decision or, or seeking too much input in a way that it becomes inefficient or ineffective in how you're right. running your business. So it's, it's how do we create kind of the best of both worlds where people understand good followership, the importance of accountability, we're very results focused, we're disciplined, but we also are building a high trust environment where we are going out and seeking the input of the people who work for us and involving them and engaging them. So it's finding that sweet spot. And we historically, it's been on the command and control side. And I think leaders today are struggling to figure out, okay, if employees are pushing for almost this other end of the spectrum, it can feel like sometimes. So helping leaders figure out how do I find that that place in the middle where we're caring for the well-being of people and leveraging them for value in the organization in a way that really brings out their strengths and their skills and their gifts, but where you're still, you still have an effectively managed mm-hmm. organization. What do you feel like? Like, what are some steps to get to that, that kind of that sweet spot, particularly as things are changing? Mm-hmm. I think kind of rapidly, it feels rapid um, since yeah. COVID. Yeah. Which is good. I think we needed that kind of that interruption, the abrupt interruption in the general, this is how we, we do business. Yes, I completely agree. We needed a correction. 
Um, so now it's up to us to kind of get it into balance in a place that's healthy for everyone um, and for the organization. So um, a couple of things in our um, in our work, we work with six in our individual leadership development work. We have six habits of resilient leadership that we uh, coach to and that we practice um, in our organization as well. And it's all about how do we create resilient leaders, resilient teams, resilient organizations. And it's very purpose-driven and it's very much a people-first approach. Mm -hmm. But the habits taken together, discipline is part of it. So this isn't just we need to build trust and we need to go and seek input from others, but it's we need to be inquisitive, we need to be courageous, we need to have optimism and demonstrate optimism. We need humility to know that we can't do this on our own and we actually need the other people in the organization to help us get where we want to go. Um, but one of the f- the foundational uh, habits is discipline because all of these pieces, if you aren't taking a disciplined approach to looking in the mirror, seeing where your gaps are and building up your skills and your habits to be um, a higher performing, more resilient leader, you're, you're just going to have setbacks. And you're not going to get anywhere. And part of this okay. about having that results focused, setting clear expectations, holding people accountable. So I think if you have that set of habits, the intent is that they are striking that balance. You can't, if you're really strong on two, but really horrible on a couple of others as a leader and the tone that you set, you're going to be out of balance. So it's striving to kind of move them all forward in parallel. And do you try to work on like, let's say you have three gaps, like do you try to work on them one at a time or all at the same time. <laughs> or does that depend on the person? Uh, it depends on the person. We usually say pick one or two okay. to start. Um, you know, we look at where are you strong? Great. What are the things you need to keep doing? Uh, but what are the one or two habits or areas where you feel like you're lacking and that that you want to focus on? Pick mm-hmm. one or two of the habits and then from there, pick one or two small actions, things that you can do consistently to build up those habits. If you take on too much at once, it can just be a bit overwhelming. And then you end up not making progress anywhere because you're trying to keep right. too many things in mind. Right, right. Just what I, I think is normal. Like we all want to take on the, the big goal and not break it down into tiny chunks and then wonder why yeah. we fail. So I think doing the one thing at a time is really the wisest and fastest way to make progress yeah and it's um it's habit formation right like we early on when we started doing this work we didn't call them habits i think we called them behaviors we've called them attributes and and it evolved into habits from the realization that this is about building new behaviors or building new habits and Mm -hmm. you don't do that overnight and it's it's more of a lifelong journey um and you're going to find a different points in your career and in different contexts or situations, you might be kind of faltering in one area more than the other. So it is, how do you build consistent new habits and behaviors? It's about small actions consistently, and then you can start to build on it over time. Right, right. And you have an amazing book called Rise Up Leadership Habits for Turbulent Times that you co-authored with Mike Watson. Yeah. Um, Are some of those habits in the book or is that a totally different ball game it's the same uh yes they are the book is all about the habits it's really about overall it's really about self-awareness personal development in the pursuit of being a great leader and for us being a great leader is about someone who lifts themselves up lifts others in pursuit of common goals or noble goals most leaders that we work with, so in small, medium organizations in particular, have no leadership training, and oftentimes they haven't had great role models. And this goes back to the command, control, authoritarian, kind of old school style of leadership. Um, so we really wanted to help people understand what does great, resilient leadership actually look like and to try to give them some of those tools. So it's really taking what we do with our clients um, one-on-one and trying to broaden the audience um, to to hopefully benefit more people. So it goes through the six habits, um, optimism, courage, discipline, humility, trust, inquisitiveness, tries to, through kind of stories, examples, try to get give people an idea of what do these look like in practice? Um, how might you know if you're you're weak or strong. So we're really trying to create some self-reflection for people. Um, and hopefully they'll come out of that again, just identifying there's just maybe one or two kind of t- t- key takeaways. And sometimes they're not 180 degree 
changes it can just be if they just tweak something it can be quite quite significant in terms of how they show up for their teams it sounds amazing i'm gonna have to order it i presume we can find it on amazon you can you can find it on amazon it's also in book book retailers globally so you might be able to find it um, wherever you shop for books but amazon for sure yeah, awesome. And on your website as well. So I should not discount that too. I'm curious about discipline because for me personally, um, as somebody who's more creative, discipline has always felt boring. And and something that I mean, I, I think I did, but without being intentional about it. And the last couple of years I've really looked at well. Oh, where can I increase that because of just creating better habits? Where do you feel like most people either excel or fall down in being disciplined? Because I think as I've reflected back on my life and my goals now, that like that it's so powerful, like just mm -hmm. doing the thing that you said you were going to do, even on the days when you don't feel like it is like game changing. Yeah. Um, when we look at discipline, there's kind of two components of it. So we look at the self-discipline side, which is around, there's some self-care pieces. So it's managing your health, managing your time, managing your energy. And then there's the, the discipline you instill in your teams and your people. And that's more around setting clear expectations, holding people right. accountable, um, having tough conversations um, and being focused on results. On the self-discipline side, this is always been the case and it's still the case of people not prioritizing their health and people not taking control of their time so taking control of their health and taking control of their time uh, we have a tendency to get whether it's really into work or care for your family or whatever it is um, that draws you in where you're giving of yourself mm -hmm and doing it in a way that you're sacrificing your own well-being and there's still is a lack of real buy-in to the concept that if you want to be a better leader or a better family member, parent, spouse, whatever it is, you've got to take care of yourself and you're going to be a significantly better leader if you have healthy practices and if you're taking control of your time. Uh, so one thing we're seeing people really struggling with in the last couple of years and still is managing their time at work. So meeting overload, people have taken on more and more uh, both at work and at home, and they're kind of gotten onto this wheel and yeah. it's set up and they can't quite figure out how to get off. So taking some small steps and they don't have to be big actions, but small tweaks to how you manage your days and your weeks um, and what you're doing from a health perspective is absolutely where I would start. The discipline on like setting goals and kind of where do you want to go in life? Again, it's like meet yourself where you are. You don't need to all of a sudden build this whole life strategy. But if you're a person who doesn't normally think about these things, right. just once a year, I'm going to spend two hours and I'm going to sit down and just answer a few questions about what does great look like long term? What's working well for me? What's not? What do I need to focus on? Um, and just those small moments of self-reflection, if it's not something you normally do, can be quite powerful. Uh, last point on creativity. So I've done a lot of great reading on, um, you know, there's this kind of myth that creative people, that creativity, you know, you need to have your muse, muse or your inspiration and kind of be fluid about it. But what you hear from people who are really successful in their creative careers is no, it's actually about discipline, getting up in the morning and making yourself do it every single day. Um, so I think kind of switching that mindset of what is, what is creativity and what's the environment in which you do creative work. Um, mm -hmm. so that's the other, and that's about the routines. Like, how do you approach your day? Yeah. And I'm so glad that you're saying that because that's something I learned several years ago, but kind of the hard way where for a long time I thought, oh, I could only write, or I could only do this thing when I was in the flow and it was this yeah. perfect moment and blah, 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 but that's not how business gets done. No. <laughs> and, um, does that mean that everything that I write or I create is absolutely my best work? I'm going to go with the definite not, but it does mean that I can consistently create content and, or whatever else I choose, whether it's making dinner or something else. Mm -hmm. but, because of the discipline and because of, well, this has to get done. So I'm going to do this thing day after day. 
the quality I think is still higher than, you know, on a day-to-day basis than the, well, I'm in the perfect flow right now moment. Yeah. Uh, yeah. And it's this, I forget where I read it or who said it, but um, the idea of um, how do you make good art? You make bad art. Yeah. And the point is you keep showing up and you, you put the time in and that's where you, you know, you perfect your craft. And then you're also able to produce higher quality work more, let's say on demand because you're building the habit of being able to do that. Yeah, absolutely. And I think if you look at any artists, like they have X amount body of work and a very small portion of it is amazingly awesome. Um, And then they have a lot of stuff that they didn't like half finished. We're going to throw away and somebody else saved. (laughs) Yeah. Uh, Yeah. So, yeah, I'm curious too, like, what do you like to do for, to be creative, to express creativity? I don't do it enough. So I, in my personal strategy, and I do have a personal strategy, one of my pillars is actually creativity. And it came from, as a kid, I was a very creative person. I like to make things. I had to spend hours alone in my room, just making stuff. Mm -hmm. Uh, And I went away from that in my life, got very focused on work and really didn't do a lot outside of work. Um, And that's still somewhat true. I love my work and it's the biggest part of my life and that's intentional. Um, But really feeling like that side of me was um, that there was a gap there and to be better all around and happier, more fulfilled person, I kind of needed to do some of that soul work, um, which for me is having some way to express myself in some kind of creative pursuit. So a couple of years ago, I actually um, set an objective for myself. I set out on a, to do a self-portrait series. Uh, So I've actually been, so visual art. So I've been doing um, photography based self-portrait series, which is this really fun combination for me of making something and using that interest in visual arts um, for a creative pursuit, but combined with my interest in personal discovery and development. So I'm super interested in understanding myself and continuing to peel back the layers as I go through life. So, uh, so it's been fun identifying kind of an aspect of my personality and then trying to create something to represent it. Uh, but I have to be so intentional about it. I have not gotten into that. I want that discipline practice of every Saturday, I spend an hour and I do some creating and I, I have not been able to get there. It's more of a burst of one weekend, I'll spend all weekend on a project and then I'll go three months and do nothing. Mm-hmm. Um, so I'm still trying to figure out how I can build creativity into my life more consistently. Um, But then there's things which, you know, studies show about how people recharge and creativity is is a piece of that. But when they talk about creativity, it's about time in nature, exposure to the arts, exposure to music. So there's other ways to get it. So I try to go to galleries and, you know, go for walks outside. And um, those are the things that I do more consistently. I think that would feed into the weekend that you have this burst of of well, it does. It builds, right? Because you're thinking yeah. about it. Um, it's in the back of your mind. You're kind of planning what your next thing is. Yeah, it's tough. Uh, it's tough when you pour a lot of energy into your work. And then when you have time off, you know, I like to relax and I like to read and those are positive activities as well. Um, but I definitely have to kind of almost force myself to do things that I then really enjoy. Um, but I guess that's a little bit like exercise too, right? Um, yeah. Make yourself do it and then you're glad you did. Yeah. I love it while I'm doing it. It's the getting to it. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. <laughs> um, and I've learned like I've, if I don't do it first thing in the morning, it's not happening. Me too. I'm kidding myself if I say I'm going to do it later in the day. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, I'll just, I have a break and I'll stop and do something. No, forget it. No. It's not happening. I'm so engrossed in, in work and everything else. Yeah. Um, I want to circle back to partly because this is like totally my jam with what you were saying about even once a year having those self reflective questions. I do that. I, I mean, I, I kind of do it monthly, quarterly, and yearly yeah. at, at different levels. And one of the things that, has been really helpful for me is I'm much more intentional about how I spend my time when I'm asking myself those questions and, and like mental noting, Oh, I didn't like that experience. Don't do that again. Mm -hmm. Or, Oh, this was awesome. We should add more of, of this in. 
Uh, and I'm just curious what your experience is with people who who do some self-reflection from a personal growth perspective, how that helps them become better leaders or not. Mm, yeah, great question. So I do the same thing. I have an annual quarterly monthly system and yeah, it's different degrees depending. Um, and we definitely promote that internally with our staff um, as well as with our clients. So with our clients, uh, we call it individual development planning. And there's definitely a leadership and like strategic focus because we're, we're usually being hired by the organization to help them through it. But it's all about how do we tap into our authentic selves as leaders and really tapping into our authentic purpose. So it's really about who you are as a person in life, um, getting clear on what you want and why you want it and how leadership fits into that equation. Leadership, entrepreneurship can be really, really hard. And those days will be there where you say, what am I doing this for? This is not worth it. So you really need to have an answer of what is this all about for you? So having that strong purpose is set work aside, set the business aside just for life to really help you reflect on, am I getting what I want out of life? And am I building a life that is fulfilling to me? And if you do that as a leader, it's going to show up in how you lead. It's going to make you more resilient and it's going to um, help you maintain that level of motivation and perseverance and determination uh, in how you're leading people. And it's also going to, more often than not, an authentic purpose is going to be about something outside of yourself. Mm -hmm. um, and so that is then going to impact how you choose to lead. So it all it's all super connected. Um, and the and sometimes aspects of that individual development plan, they're very personal. It might be about family, it might be about creativity, it might be about um, health and well-being. But the acknowledgement or understanding that to be a better leader and to show up for the people who I lead in a way that helps them grow and helps them find their potential, I need to be doing the same thing for myself. Um, so it's really that kind of holistic personal development that absolutely creates more resilient organizations because you have a leader who's clear on their purpose, they're developing the habits of good leadership, and then they're helping those in the or others in the organization do the same thing. Yeah, absolutely. I know for me, every time I make a shift where I level up, even if it's something as simple as being more consistent with my workouts or working out at a, heart, a heavier or more intense level, it actually shows up with my clients. Like, Suddenly, and I won't even have said anything to them. It's just this energetic, I guess, connection that like they'll be walking more, they'll be doing something else that's similar. And I that's what I find so fascinating is when you're really living into your purpose and and taking care of yourself and working on yourself, that ripple effect just naturally flows out to the people that you're surrounded with. It absolutely. And it's you inspire others. When you lift yourself, you lift others. It's that idea of if you work on yourself um, and from a leader perspective, getting clear on your purpose and, and why you're doing this and why it matters, people see it mm -hmm. uh, and they're inspired by that example. And then they, they in turn make shifts in their own lives and the ability to have that type of impact, just as a, whether you're a leader of people or not, that is impactful to people around you and to the world. And then you take someone in a leadership role their potential impact by doing that is even more significant because people are watching you constantly and you're, they're being exposed to you constantly. So how you take care of yourself yeah. and how you conduct yourself is super impactful. I have a client who, an organization, I've worked with this vice president who retired recently and we were having a session with his team and now there's a new leader on the team. And how they talk about the leader who just retired, just incredible respect and trust for this person. And one thing they always bring up is his focus on well-being, his own well-being and health and how they'll call him in the middle of the day. And you can tell he's running on the treadmill or, and this, this has had a huge impact on this group of fairly senior leaders of just seeing the discipline that this person has and taking care of themselves and how that's inspired them to do the same and inspired them to also help their people prioritize their well-being. Mm -hmm. So it's a huge trickle-down effect just because one person said that this matters and I'm going to make it a priority. Yeah. Yeah. 
And I think that's where like real change comes. Mm-hmm. Because if we, we all feel better, we're going to show up differently. And then what we create will be different. Yeah. So that's awesome. What would you say to somebody who's to a, like a new leader or a very young leader? Like what's one piece of advice you would give them? Read Rise Up. <laughs> <laughs> Like, I'm serious, yes, though. Um, <laughs> uh, really, though, I, I think there's two pieces to it, and, and they relate to the concepts in the book. But one is spend a little time reflecting on why you're doing it. And it, it doesn't need to be a huge exercise, and you don't need to figure out all of the answers, but just a little bit of time connecting with yourself on either why do I want this role or promotion, or, or now that I have it, wait, what was this about? And why did I want to do this? And just spend a little bit of time connecting with what it means to you. Mm -hmm. Um, And that's going to help give you some clarity. And you can build on that as you as you go along. And it might might evolve from there. The other piece is understand what good leadership really looks like. So read, uh, you may not have the examples in your organization. I hope that you do. I hope that there are phenomenal leaders that you can work from, but that's not true in most organizations. So broaden your perspective of what leadership is and try to get a a holistic understanding of that. And so I think um, reading books is a great way to do that. Mm -hmm. Uh, And then pick a couple areas to grow into. Uh, again, pick, pick small habits based on what you've learned, what you've read of kind of things where you feel like you have a gap. Uh, but it's less about, let's say, technical competence. It's more about what are the behaviors you're demonstrating when you show up at work and show up with your team and really understanding that how you show up in every interaction that you have with people is going to set the tone. So you just need to be really in self-aware and intentional about what you're the energy that you're bringing Mm -hmm. and know that you can't do it alone so it's you've got to help your people grow and fulfill their potential and that's how you'll succeed as a leader that's a lot of amazing wisdom so for those of uh our audience who are new leaders or aspiring leaders i think that's quite the the place for them to get started and definitely read rise up i'm going to order it after we uh, we hop off. Yeah. <laughs> Ali, this has been so much fun. And I feel like we've talked about so many different aspects of leadership and how to um, just grow because I don't think it's something that anybody masters. It's just continuing to evolve. But for anybody who wants to connect with you, where's the best place for them to find you? Uh, best place. So two places. One, our website, which is ignitemanagement.ca. Um, if you click into my bio there, my, I think my phone number and email address are both there, but the best uh, other way to just kind of follow along and, and connect with me is LinkedIn. I'm quite active. So that's the best place to follow me and you can see what I'm up to. Awesome. And we're going to have all of the links in the show notes, including the book, which everybody should get. And um, again, thank you so much for being on. Thank you so much. Thank you so much for being a listener of the Tribe of Leaders podcast. I am so grateful for each and every episode that you tune in and listen to. And I hope that you get a ton of value that you can implement starting today. I do have just a quick favor. If you wouldn't mind hopping on to wherever it is that you listen to podcasts and leave us a rating and review, it would help us tremendously so that the Tribe of Leaders podcast can be found more easily and help inspire other entrepreneurial leaders.